Tonight on NJTV News, with money and time running out, Atlantic City's making a deal. It could mean tough cuts, suspended labor contracts, and privatized services. Everything's on the table, but at least they're at the table. Nearly three million New Jersey adults don't earn enough to live. Faced with growing poverty and income disparity, the Assembly starts work to reform fiscal and social policies to rebuild the middle class. And those pristine snow caps atop your cars, they could get you in trouble. We'll tell you why removing the snow before you go can spare you a citation, a fine, or even an accident. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at Two Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Tempers are still simmering in Atlantic City following the state's latest attempt to stave off certain bankruptcy. The Christie brokered plan isn't a state takeover, exactly, but it would have the state take over most of the city's decision-making power over finances, contracts, and assets. Brianna Venosi was with city council members as the news spread. As news trickled down the state from Trenton to Atlantic City, weary residents grew fiery as they waited to hear details of the deal brokered between Mayor Don Guardian and Governor Christie. If you're going to continue to have bathroom bills and not let the taxpayers know what's going on with the future that they have to deal with, then there's going to be a problem. It was supposed to be an emergency council meeting to declare bankruptcy for the city. Instead, Mayor Guardian and Senate President Sweeney, who remained out of the public's view, met with council members in an hours-long executive session to go over the pending legislation. The mayor came back and assured us that it's not a takeover. And just to show you how important it was, because we, we, we were upset, all things considered, we were upset. We didn't know what was going on. But after the emotion dies down, and you get a new perspective and understand that we need help. The council voted unanimously to pass a resolution agreeing to work with the state's plan. Please understand we need your help. We need everyone to pay or play your part. We'll pull this bill, we'll start with a brand new bill. Atlantic City uh, will have representation, meaning City Council and the Mayor, in helping to craft this bill. Just how the state will help Atlantic City get back on its feet is still unclear. Details will be hashed out in the coming days and weeks. The council president, while concerned the negotiations could blow up, seemed confident in the new plan. I believe it's a partnership. We're going to go into anything optimistic. And, you know, he shared his plan, but as they say, the devil's in the details. We don't have a bill, but at least we at the infancy stage where we can actually sit down at the table, state our position, and hopefully things that we want to be working to the bill as well, but there, it's, it's, it's not a takeover. As part of this bill, we're going to be reintroducing the considerable funding from casinos redirected toward the city. So the, the IATs, the ACA, the uh, stabilization of casino uh, property taxes coming in without tax appeals. And I think the state has no right to be here in the city. They raped the city since 1980. They took our luxury tax. Though most residents expressed relief, some are still on the fence. So too is Assembly Speaker Vincent Prieto, who was noticeably absent from yesterday's press conference. I have not seen what the new legislation is going to look like, so obviously I'll reserve you know, my opinions until I see it. But just by hearing yesterday what was said at the uh, press conference, you know, collective bargaining, doing away with that, that's something that I would you know, have a problem with. So I want to see it first. It seems not just the structure, but the wording of this bill that played a large part in soothing tempers, call it an agreement, a partnership or an intervention. The leaders in AC are on board just as long as it's not a takeover. In the newsroom, I'm Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. 
No tax increase for the town of Lakewood. No school buses either. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Lakewood, where voters were asked to pony up more than $6 million for courtesy buses. A full 99% voted no. It means thousands of children in grades K through 12, including roughly half of all public school kids, will have to walk or be driven to school starting February 25th, along with 25,000 private school kids. Orthodox community leaders voted against raising taxes for busing, contending the state should account for Lakewood's rapidly rising private school population and provide more aid for busing. Next to East Rutherford, where the Jets will have to pony up nearly $324,000 in back pay for 52 cheerleaders. The flight crew took the team to court, claiming they were provided uniforms and paid $150 per game, but were not paid for practices, calendar photo shoots, or other appearances, and were not compensated for other Jets requirements, like having their hair straightened. The Jets made no admission of wrongdoing, but it has changed its pay policy. Other NFL teams are being pressured to follow suit. Finally, Hamilton, where 33,000 property owners will find out by Friday how much more they have to pony up in property taxes, based on the first townwide revaluation since 1999. And if those shockwaves aren't enough, this one certainly was. A garbage truck fueled by natural gas caught fire and exploded, punching a hole through the front of Doris Patley's house just as firefighters were pulling her out the back. It also poked a hole in a roof across the street, melted siding on two adjacent homes, and caused quite a scare, but no injuries. And that's our Garden State Express for Wednesday, January 27th. Something happening in your town? Tip us off. More New Jersey residents are living in poverty than at any time in the past 50 years. That's according to Legal Services of New Jersey. With the gap between wealthy and impoverished widening, the Assembly's employing a full court press to address the problem. Chief Political Correspondent Michael Aaron reports. Today, I had asked four committees to hold hearings to see what we can do. The Assembly Human Services Committee, the Transportation Committee, the Housing Committee, and the Women and Children Committee all focused on poverty today. They looked at things like welfare. The cash grant that we provide for a, a family of three in New Jersey is $424 a month, compared to $2,800 a month, which the same department that serves these families recognizes is what you actually need. They looked at mass transit and the poor. A huge workforce in a city like Perth Amboy, only a couple of miles, maybe three or four miles away from lots of jobs in Raritan Center, uh, but there's no way to get from there to there. They looked at affordable housing, job training, and nutritional assistance. The administration um, decided to cut food stamps for 11,000 people, so that's also an issue that we've been frustrated with. Speaker Prieto says he's not looking to spend more money on the poor, just fix programs and remove bottlenecks. When you factor a livable wage, you have 2.8 million residents that live in poverty. That is embarrassing for the state of New Jersey, and we have to do something about it. Advocates for the poor unveiled their wish lists from better housing for the disabled to better pay for low-wage workers. When you raise the wages of workers, when you raise up the working poor, you actually have a, a beneficial impact on our local economy. Everyone appreciated the opening of the dialogue, but Republicans thought it should be broadened to attack the cost of living itself. Let's start with property tax reduction because property taxes affect every citizen in the state. Whether you're a homeowner, 
or a renter. It has a direct impact on your life, and it's a very regressive tax. The fiscally conservative group Americans for Prosperity agrees with that. We really need to lower taxes here in New Jersey, make our business climate better. That's the kind of thing that will allow people who are in poverty or transitioning out of poverty have more opportunity here in New Jersey. State House veteran Janine LaRue gave Prieto high marks. You think it's a smart, a smart move, a wise move? Well, it's not just a smart move to carve it out as a priority, but it's a very smart move to carve out a non-legislative day on a Wednesday, holding hearings all day in four committees. It's masterful. For me, Michael, I came from these beginnings. I know what it is to be on assistance. I know what it is to ride on buses. So I know what it takes to be able to, you know, grab yourself by the brute straps and pull yourself up. Prieto will ask the four committee chairs for today's best ideas, then put together a package of anti-poverty bills. Senate President Steve Sweeney said today he'll support the effort. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. That snow-capped mobile wedding cake of a car ahead of you on the highway is posing a danger, and its owner is risking a hefty fine for failing to comply with the law that requires you to remove the snow before you go. Michael Hill reports. Three days after Jonas, this truck was southbound on the turnpike with snow and maybe ice on its tail and tumbling from its roof for miles, an apparent violation of New Jersey law. Joanna Aguilar, the owner of JJBB Transport and Freight in Garfield, tells NJTV News a friend removed all the snow from this truck. And did that somebody do that after this blizzard this weekend? Yes. You're sure about that? Positive. But the owner's tune changed when NJTV News told her what the video shows. Like I'm saying, I, I, I've heard it was removed. It was somebody private of mine that is doing it. and. I didn't know it would have had a snow. The owner said she was going to check on it because she's aware of the law. New Jersey law is pretty clear when it comes to removing snow and ice from vehicles after a storm. It applies to all vehicles and all exposed surfaces of the vehicles. Violators face fines of $25 to $75. But if that snow or ice goes flying and causes property damage or hurts someone, the fine shoots all the way up to $200 to $1,000. New Jersey reminds Parkway and Turnpike drivers with electronic signs, ice and snow, remove it before you go. But plenty of vehicles on the Garden State's roadways still had snow on them on Tuesday. We are seeing less and less of it. We have created education campaigns for the last few years and they've started to really curb the danger that we've seen, but it's always a good reminder that you need to clear your entire car. George Cannon says the company he drives an 18-wheeler for removes the snow before he hits the road. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do because we, we all know as drivers that we can't drive with that snow because you have blocks of ice. If you stop, sometimes a block of ice is slide right in front or it can, depending on what size it is, it can hit somebody's car. So it's dangerous. A message that seems to have gotten lost on a driver last year in Andover Township where snow from his own car's roof slid off when he stopped, blocking his view as he rammed into another vehicle. We've gone to many incidents where windshields have been smashed by ice coming off of roofs. New Hampshire firefighter Tom Ferguson tells how he avoids becoming a statistic. I look real quick in my mirror and see if I can get to another lane or if I have to, I slow way down and let the ice fall in front of me. But if you're on the highway at highway speed, it's tough to react to uh, ice coming off a roof. Law enforcers say that's the other danger. Between Friday and Tuesday, state police say they've been busy reminding drivers of the law with 24 summonses and 58 warnings. Michael Hill, NJTV News. In Newark, the problem's not the cars, but the streets they're stuck on. The man at the top is taking it on the chin for a slow snow response. Newark Mayor Roz Barak is being accused of putting in charge political allies who were inexperienced, inadequate, and ineffective, leaving Newark with 40 miles of snow-filled roads. David Cruz spoke with the mayor. I would imagine this is probably the toughest 
management challenge of your administration, yeah? Management challenge? Yes. No. I got 30 inches of snow. Uh, this is probably the biggest snowstorm the city has had in decades, uh, and, and it all came down in one day. So uh, I think that we've been managing it pretty well. Uh, what, the difficult thing is that it's three feet of snow. Yeah. Right. So what happened? What, what turned it? Aside from the 30 inches of snow, uh, people leaving their cars out in the street, people not adhering to the don't travel. It, it seemed like there was a, a bunch of little problems that amounted to one big one. No, I, actually, I think that people weren't ready for 30 inches of snow. They believed that we were going to get 7 to 14 inches. That's what the press kept telling them over and over again, and we know how the press can be wrong over and over and over again. And uh, ultimately, that's not what happened. They got 30 inches, and it came down 2 or 3 inches per hour, and people were caught out there on their way home trying to get out of there. People thought they could traverse it, and they got stuck. And uh, we had to uh, bail them out. That's uh, our job, so we had to make that happen. But, uh, you know, all, every city that's, uh, you know, about the size of this, of this one has had difficulties not only throughout New Jersey but up the eastern seaboard. I don't think anybody uh, was ready for this snow event that took place. Uh, and, and many of us, uh, and my hat goes off to the mayor of D.C. who from the beginning said this is going to take us three days. And uh, they prepared for three days. You know, we had expectations that we could get out uh, before three days. Uh, we weren't able to do that, you know. So uh, it actually took us about three days, like she said, to get to where we are now. How much did removing those stranded cars and so on, how much did that cost you? Not in terms of dollars, but in terms of critical time to, to get snow removed. I, I would say it cost us uh, uh, at least a, a, a half a day, uh, easily. You know, um, you're talking about uh, the first day, about 280 cars. Uh, right now, we moved 191 cars uh, since then. So you're talking about almost 400 cars that had to be towed uh, out of the city, uh, you know, that stopped plows from getting through. Other, and especially if you live on a smaller block, it uh, slowed us down tremendously. Uh, but I, I think we did a, a, a great job given all of the uh, obstacles that were thrown in our way. Were you, were you ready for the kind of uh, negative feedback that you were getting on social media, et cetera, from people? Um, you, know, if, you know that people are going to be upset. I mean, they're inconvenienced. They're going to be upset. They're going to be frustrated, angry. People have the right to be frustrated. I mean, anytime you, uh, your, your normal procedure is messed up, you're going to be upset. And you're going to have to, you want to blame somebody. So obviously, that's what's going to happen. I understand that. But that's not, I don't think that that is the majority of Newarkers. I don't think that represents the majority. I think when we were out there, people were coming out of their homes, uh, thanking us, shoveling snow, putting plows on their trucks, helping us plow snow. I mean, there are many people in Newark who, uh, in the middle of a crisis, step up to the plate and get out there and help get this done and, and don't take the social media. Uh, they understand that uh, they have to help their neighbors. People who came out, helped us move dialysis patients, called in, identified uh, paraplegics. So there was a lot of Newarkers on the ground out there who, uh, without them, you know, being our eyes and ears, it would have been very difficult for us to even do what we're doing now. Have you stopped so far to kind of assess, do a post-mortem, or are you still too much in the emergency right now? Well, I think we're out of the emergency stage, but uh, we've, been, we've been thinking about it, but ultimately we can't do it until everything is done, until we are uh, finished, uh, and then we do our assessment like we do in a any major uh, crises. We're going to have winter events like this. We're going to have other kind of events uh, that happen that we have to mobilize for in the city. Uh, so I don't anticipate this being the last time that we have to do this. So, Is there one thing that pops out at you that you'll say, oh, next time we're going to handle that first? Next time I'm going to say it's going to take three days for us to get out of this. And uh, please bear with us. And uh, we're going to make sure we get to you when we can. Uh, there's no time in, in the history of I've been here that there's been any kind of storm that the next day every street in the city was blacktop. That just has not ever been the case. Uh, and they certainly haven't had three feet of snow. So I understand that it took a very long time and that people are, are tense and frustrated about it. But we'll get through it. It's going to be over soon. Uh, and we'll get back to business as usual. And then the next storm, right? Yes, sir. And then we prepare for the next storm. That's right. A, we, we need to do something about global warming. Right. All right, Mayor Rasparaka, thank okay. you very much. Yep.
She led the charge for women's right to vote in the 1920s, won the fight to protect women from discrimination in the 1960s, fought for a constitutional guarantee of equal rights for women. This century's celebrated disruptors stand on the shoulders of a legendary Jersey girl named Alice Paul, who now has a museum dedicated to continuing her cause. Maddie Orton reports. She was a suffragist, the mind behind the Equal Rights Amendment, and a rebel. Mount Laurel's own Alice Paul would have been 131 this year. And through the Alice Paul Institute, she continues to inspire new generations of young women. We didn't really want to create a museum as much as we wanted to do something, a living legacy to Alice Paul's work, to keep her work for equality going. The Institute is located in Paul's old farmhouse called Paulsdale. Programs there and in local schools focus on teaching kids from second through 12th grades about leadership using female role models as examples. They also educate students about the women's rights movement and civics more broadly. In a typical field trip, we'll go through several voting exercises where it really comes home to them what it is to not have a voice. But the most intensive programs are with middle and high school aged girls. At the end of a workshop, it's always a sign of success when a girl has a new definition of a leader, someone who sets a goal and works to meet it. Um, to change something for the better. And that's where Alice Paul is a great example. Well-behaved women seldom make history. Christina Myers is the Institute's Director of Programs and an Alice Paul Scholar. She says with White House protests, parades, and numerous arrests under her belt, Paul is considered a radical. She's known as a militant suffragist. Uh, she is doing things that are going to get her arrested. Uh, so she definitely stands outside of the sphere of what is acceptable for, for women. Not least of these reasons is her authoring the Equal Rights Amendment when many suffragists were dissolving efforts after women got the right to vote. That's considered the most radical, that women were capable of doing everything that men did and should be legally recognized uh, equally. Paul studied law, earning three of her six degrees in the subject to better advocate for the ERA. And her efforts were legendary. Anytime a reporter would call that wants to talk to her, uh, she would say, first, call three of your representatives and get them to support the ERA and then she'll talk to them. Despite gaining a large amount of support over the last century, the ERA was never signed into law. I think that's one of the mi biggest mis misconceptions among Americans is that we already have an Equal Rights Amendment, that it passed in the 1970s. Myers says Alice Paul fought for passage of the ERA until her death in the 1970s. And through education and advocacy, the Institute picks up where Paul left off. One of our core missions is to advocate for passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. So all of the girls in all of our programs learn about the Equal Rights Amendment. That's what she would want us to be working on. The Alice Paul Institute will celebrate its namesake at the organization's annual birthday bash on February 21st. In the newsroom, I'm Maddie Orton, NJTV News. This digital revolution that's connecting us to each other and a network of things was created by strings of zeros and ones, but it was strings of dots and dashes that led the Wizard of Menlo Park to create our most prolific invention factory. Lauren Wonka reports. Towering over a 35-acre state park is a tribute to New Jersey's legendary inventor, Thomas Edison. This is where invention was created. Menlo Park. In the early 1870s, it was a failed housing development in a rural area until Thomas Edison purchased land here in 1875. What Edison does here is he creates what today we know as the first organized research and development site. Edison decided, I don't want to be last. I don't want to be second. I want to be first. So he hires experts, people who are experts in their own field, and he brings them all together here. It's almost like a brain trust. The Ohio native had been conducting experiments since he was a child, but it's the phonograph, an invention created at Menlo Park, that makes him a household name, says Kathleen Carlucci, director of the Thomas Edison Center at Menlo Park. He got the idea after conducting experiments on the telephone. People were fascinated by the phone. Phonograph. No one had ever heard the voice recorded and played back. Carlucci says Edison had a burst of astonishing creativity here in Menlo Park, creating 400 of his most important inventions. He became known as the Wizard of Menlo Park. Edison himself called 
this site, the Invention Factory. The eager inventor soon moves on to light the incandescent light bulb. And that's what Edison's known for. He doesn't invent the light bulb, but he makes it a commercial commodity. Edison creates an experimental electric railway at Menlo Park and hundreds of other things. He was awarded 1,093 U.S. patents. In the late 1880s, Edison moved his lab from Menlo Park to West Orange. He died there in 1931. Soon after, the Menlo Park property was donated to New Jersey and became Edison State Park, says Carlucci. The Edison pioneers, which included those who work with the inventor, were determined to honor his legacy and his associates with this 131-foot tower. It was dedicated in 1938 on Edison's birthday, February 11th. Today, it still serves as a reminder that this inventor let his imagination and creativity soar. His eyes were open to possibilities, and it really shows, especially our youth today, with hard work and, and persistence, you can really create a, a beautiful world. In Edison, I'm Lauren Wonko, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, starting from scratch on bills Christie pocket vetoed, including one that would have banned convicted carjackers from buying guns. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. And the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Hi, I'm Ralph LaRosa. Oh, and Elmo's Elmo. And we're here to remind you how important it is for your family to have an emergency kit. That's right. I'm thinking about what to put in my family's emergency kit. Want to help me think? Okay. An emergency kit should have a flashlight and extra batteries. Oh, flashlight? Oh, batteries? And <laughs> lots of water and canned food. Oh, okay. Water? Oh, canned food? Wow, Elmo, you really are a good thinker. Thank you, Mr. Ralph. <laughs> Download Sesame Street's free Let's Get Ready app at your favorite app store today.